it's not really clear what the relationship is between Yalta and Rav Nachman, okay? I'm just gonna throw this piece in there. There, um, Tal Elon in 1997 and Rachel Adler in 1998, so the late 90s, a couple of scholars really question um, whether Yalta was actually Rav Nachman's wife. So we have, for instance, a couple of comments of Rashi in a few places in the Talmud that Yalta was Rav Nachman's wife. That's what she's doing there. I think it's a, I'm just going to put that on the table and we're going to come back to that. <laughs> okay. Or should we just, you know, I'm just going to put it out we there. Can so, talk about it. All right, let's talk about it. So Yalta, she is not some insignificant lady of the Talmud. She actually is the most frequently appearing woman in the Talmud. And she appears, she's mentioned seven times by name. Let me put it that. She's mentioned by name seven times. All well, seven times are by name? What? Are all seven times mentioned by name? Seven times by name and definitely, yes. Do you have more? I, I think that part of the reason why there's a question about whether she is in fact Rav Nachman's wife is because there are some sources where she is um, mentioned as the daughter of the Exilarch. There are other texts where Rav Nachman uh, um, does things for his wife who is the daughter of the Exilarch. So those are two texts which make it sound like she's the same person. Um, and then there's this text where they're sitting at the same table together. Um, there's maybe two texts like this where they seem to be in intimate conversation or close quarters. Um, but I'm not sure if her name is in all six of those stories. I have to check it. All right, um, so let's go to the text, but, ready? But I will say that the reason why Talilan and, um, and Rachel Adler are curious about it is because um, we're looking for these you know, women who can represent something uh, for women of that time. Um, and there are very, very few women who are mentioned by name or do anything dramatic enough to make it into the Talmud. Um, and that there's also a possibility that um, there's, there's several um, sort of instances of a woman showing up on the rabbinic radar and they're um, intertwined to build up this one character who represents, you know, maybe several different moments of women uh, making a splash. Like a composite <clears throat> yeah. character? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, you ready? Here they are. These are the, the specifically mentioning of Yalta instances. Oh, okay. <laughs> One is Beitza and 25B. That is where, I'll just mention what they are. So here is normally um, someone should not be carried on the shoulders, right? A poles on a chair borne by poles on a festival. But Rav Nachman permitted Yalta because Yalta is different. Somehow she was afraid. Okay. Then there's Shabbat 54b, where uh, ba, 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 something to do with Rav Nachman sort of making a joke about Yalta as far as giving birth, okay? Again, not mentioning as wife. There's Gitin 67b, where she did some interesting thing with the bathhouse and coins and wine. There's Nita 25b, where Yalta does this... Um, Yalta's Ruse, if anybody's read the uh, Menstrual and Purity book, or yes, Menstrual Purity. The Charlotte Menstrual. von Robert book, right. All right, yeah. so Nita 25B, she like, she she basically does sock shopping, that's, she brings. That's probably the most important um, text to contrast to this one, yeah. because there she is part of the halachic discussion. She seems to know enough mm -hmm. to go from rabbi to rabbi to ask and to also argue for yeah. the halakh answer she's looking for. Um, and I think in contrast to what she does here, which is she's angry, she doesn't speak, she doesn't argue, she doesn't get involved in uh, how did you interpret this pasuk, I would interpret it differently. And so there she, she sort of represents someone who is smart enough and will, willing to engage in the halakhic process. And here she's sort of circumventing the halakhic process by just showing her rage in the most she dramatic does. way. Oh, right, right. But in the, right, in the Shabbat 20B, or Nita 20B, she's working within the system to get the, the results that she wants. And, and kind yeah. of similarly with that earlier one, where the sitting on the chair borne by poles on a yuntif, that she gets Rav Nachman to permit her to do that, even though that's not really how people behave, right? Um, so there's that. We have Kedushin 70A, which is really fast. Um, uh, da, 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 da. That's an interesting one, which we'll get back to. And then we have Hulin 109B, which is a really fascinating one, which I think really demonstrates Yalta's 
um, knowledge, really. I don't know if you're familiar with this one, but she says to Rav Nachman that everything that the merciful one prohibited to, prohibited to us, he permitted us a similar item, and then she goes in detail. Okay, so th that's, that's it. Well, that also has to do with trying to work within, there she's sort of making her own explanation for why she should be able to drink milk that's part of a, um, she's looking for a way to, to eat milk and meat together. Um, and she's saying, there's got to be, if I have a taiva for this, if I have a desire for this, there's got to be some kind of other version which will enable me to, to fulfill this desire. Um, and that, I think the argument is that a, um, an udder that has milk within it, is that what it is? Something like that? Yes. Um, uh, it is allowed, or maybe it's a... Yeah, the fat of the medicine, the brain of shibuta, garuta, tongue of fish, uh, oh, upon hearing this, Nachman said to his cooks, roast udders on a spit for her. Yeah, oh, she says, I wish to eat a dish that tastes like animal. meat cooked in milk. Yeah, so if you kill an animal that already has milk within the udder, then you could cook that udder. Um, and that's the one exception. So they're also, like the Shabbat one, she's trying to get an exception to the rule, but trying to do it from within the system, more or yeah. less. Yeah. Um, and she's very verbal and talking, you know, as if she's, um, an even footing with the rabbis and trying to get um, to get the answer she's looking for. Yeah, I will say the one time it's kind of confusing and it could possibly point up and sort of mention that Yalta is Rav Nachman's wife is that Kedushin 70A, 70B, where Rav Yehuda stops by and is basically stopped by Rav Nachman's house. And there's this whole thing about let the master send greetings of peace to my to Yalta, not to my wife. And then Rabbi Huda said, no, a woman's voice is nakedness. And then um, eventually, this is what Shmuel says, one might, yeah. Anyways, it does mention later on his wife, okay? Now, the whole reason that I bring all of this up, I, did you want to say something? Well, I think in this story, the fact that they're sitting together with Ula, um, I, I should say, I think that this story is one of the, um, one of the cases that also supports the fact that they're potentially married um, because potentially. potentially, yeah, definitely did not say it explicitly, but the, um, the, the part of the text that we skipped, which is the context, the legal context for the, the story itself talks about what you're supposed to do with this cup of wine that you do Birkat uh, that you use in the ritual of Birkat And it says explicitly, you should pass it to the members of the household, Bitehu. Um, and essentially, um, the household, the bait, is often a nickname for one's wife. Um, and so the context, that, that part of the context, and also the midrash that he's playing with it, Ula is playing with, on the fertility, um, that the man of the household makes a bracha over a cup of wine and then passes it to the members of his house so that they can also have the blessing of fertility. I do think that there's more reason, again, not because it's explicit, but more reason from the um, content of the story to assume that they might be married. So now I want to entertain, basically in looking at the story, I want to look at it through the eyes of both possibilities, both that she's his wife and also that she is not, I don't know if you could say a colleague, but certainly like friends-ish, friends right? And right. I think and she's the daughter, I think she's the daughter of the Exilarch. So she is um, wealthy. Uh, at least there's one other text where that makes it clear, and also the, the, the one on Shabbat about her being carried on the, um, the poles, on the, the chair on the poles. There's, yeah. there's an element in a few of the stories that she is sort of um, similar to the Matrona, similar to the, these Greek Roman women, uh, sorry, Roman women who appear in stories as someone who is sitting at the table, part of the conversation, sometimes pushing buttons of the men at the table um, who right. think that she we're questioning whether she belongs there or not. Right, so I think it's pretty clear that Rav Nachman is married to the daughter of the Exilarch, but it's not clear what Yalta's, you know, right? We don't know that Yalta per se is necessarily the daughter of the Exilarch. How about I that? that? I okay. have this memory that there's two separate texts. Okay, uh, so one but I, I wanna play with our, we could have two alternative timelines going on. One is that Yalta is indeed Rav Nachman's wife and the other that she's just uh, a friend, right? 
So it could be when we come back to our story on Bracho 51b, that sh that part of the sort of the her rage, as it were, was you would assume that I'm his wife. Like I should be sent the the, the koshel bracha. I should get the blessing cup because I'm my own person. I'm not actually related. I'm just a friend of his. You just assume that all women are, you know, married to men. Mm -hmm. That's one. That's one reading. The other, of course, is that she is indeed just, you know, she's not just a person on her own, but that she is, as most people and Rashi would say, his wife. And of course, she's still upset. She should get the the cup of blessing. And I think that's ultimately how the the whole story turns out.